Welcome, everyone. I'm Ashanti Edwards, the Director for Professional Development at the American Society for Cell Biology. We are pleased to offer this special seminar series with the Public Information Committee as a part of ASEB's Professional Development Webinar Series. Today, our moderator, Lorena Benedetti, will be introducing our featured author. Lorena? Hello, everyone. Greetings, and thank you for joining our webinar. My name is Sorana Benedetti, and I'm a research scientist in the lab of Jennifer Lippico's work at Zanilla Reserve Campus. On behalf of ACB and the Public Information Committee, I would like to welcome you to the first of our series of webinars focused on communicating scientific information visually. Cell biology experiments can be tough. After weeks of pilot work and field attempts, we eventually obtain meaningful results. Having completed the hard work, how do we make our data shine? In this webinar, we will focus on analyzing, processing, and presenting microscopy experiments with an emphasis on reproducibility and, remov and removing bias. We will discuss the current and best practices for interpreting and communicating cell biology. Our speaker today is Steve Royal. Steve is a professor in the Center for Mechanochemical Cell Biology, Warwick Medical School at the University of Warwick in the UK. He runs a research group working on cell division and membrane traffic in human cells. Steve Lab pursues a quantitative approach to cell biology, and he has written a handbook, The Digital Cell, published by Cold Spring Arbor Laboratory Press on using computers in cell biology. He maintains a web resource, quantics.org, that focuses on data visualization and coding. And Steve was awarded in, uh, the 2021 Hook Medal for Cell Biology from the British Society for Cell Biology. If you have any questions, please type in the Q&A box. Again, thank you everyone for participating. I'm now happy to turn the attention to Steve. Okay, thank you very much, Lorena, for the introduction. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me okay and uh, see my first slide. So uh, yeah, as Lorena said, uh, today's webinar is about how we go from microscope to figure. So this could be a figure in your thesis or a figure in a published paper, but it's about how to make the most out of your microscopy data. So microscopy is a primary tool for us as cell biologists. How can we show that to um, show that data to best effect in, in a figure? Okay, so uh, going from microscope to figure uh, used to be uh, easier in some ways than it is today. So I'm gonna start with this historical uh, picture here, which is a, a, JC, a figure from a JCB paper in the mid 90s. So this is a classic paper has been cited thousands of times. And you can see that um, it was certainly a lot easier to have a, a figure back in those days in terms of the amount of data that went into it. Um, however, get, getting that data into a figure was quite difficult back then. The, the authors had to take a take photographs onto film, get that film developed, um, print that, uh, assemble the, the figure as a physical thing and then re-photograph that and send that to the journal. It's certainly easier to make figures these days. But the other thing you'll notice here is the lack of quantification. So this is a very much a qualitative figure. What the authors have done is they've expressed uh, a few different uh, mutants of a particular protein and then taken some images of those um, mutants in these cells. And you can see, if you look at the legend in the last sentence, it says, VSVG exactly overlaps with lectin. And this is a sort of quantitative statement that the authors want to make, but they only have qualitative data. And so really these days, you can't get away with this um, sort of presentation because we need to know how representative these cells really are of all the cells that were imaged in that experiment. And that's something that the old figures didn't really show you. So I'm going to fast forward now to this year. This is a JCB paper from my lab, just published a couple of months ago. And this is one figure from that paper. And the first thing you'll see is, you know, there's a heck of a lot more data on this figure than there was in the 1990s version. So there's actually three different experiments compiled into one figure now. So what used to be a figure in the 90s is now a panel in a figure these days. Um, so in that sense, there's a, there's a lot more work goes into figures. But what I want to draw your attention to is, um, so in A, we've got one type of experiment. In B and C, we've got uh, immunofluorescence and some quantification. Then in D, we've got a live cell experiment, some stills from a live cell movie and some quantification from that uh, data set. And so this is the point that I'm trying to make here. We, we still show representative images, 
But alongside that, we have some quantification of those images so that we can understand um, exactly how representative those images are and what the whole data set look like. So just to underscore this, again, this is a figure from a paper that my lab have published this year. And I'm just going to draw your attention to the top two panels because that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Basically, we have what I'll call panel A today, which is some example data. And then in panel B, we have the quantification. And this is what I'm going to talk about, about how we go from microscope to figure. It's how we get panel A and panel B. And so that's what I'm going to be uh, trying to cover today. Now, um, every step of the way could be its own webinar, actually. Uh, there's a lot of uh, information to cover here and I'm not going to be able to do it all. So what I want to do is just give you an overview of the whole process um, and just cover the um, sort of best practices and the uh, and give you some tips for how to do this uh, in, in the best way possible. Um, but I'm not going to have time to go into detail about every step. Okay, so first of all, we need to do the microscopy. And really this takes uh, three things. We need uh, a good sample, we need some uh, microscopy and microscopy skills. And then finally, we need to take some images. So I've got three slides on those on how to take the images in the first place. OK, so starting off with the sample, um, there are several things to consider here. Uh, you need the reagents that you're using to be well validated. So, for example, antibodies you're using, do they hit the right target or do they? is there any crosstalk there? Uh, if you've used fluorescent proteins, do they aggregate? Is your protein going to the right place? All of these things need to be validated ahead of you actually doing the experiment that's going, going to go into the paper. Everything else needs to be optimized as well. You know, things like fixation can affect the ultrastructure of the cell. Um, uh, the permeabilization and the labeling need to be optimized. Even things like the mounting or the cover slip used can affect how good your images are at the end. So uh, that was considering sort of fixed samples. If you're doing live cell work, you need to make sure that that temperature control in, on the uh, incubator is, is correct and working well. The CO2 levels are okay, or maybe you're using CO2 independent media. All of these things need to be optimized because if your sample is garbage, you're gonna get garbage out. So your images will be uh, meaningless and any analysis you do will be meaningless. So all of these things need to be optimized before you um, start taking any images. You need to have positive and negative controls. Uh, the negative control should always be in your experiment, a positive control if you can, uh, if you have one. And you need to be minimizing any bleed through or crosstalk. Um, so for example, secondary antibodies giving um, crosstalk uh, when you take your images. And you need to be thinking about the microscope that you're gonna use. So uh, you need to think about the setup of that microscope. Perhaps, you know, it doesn't have a red filter set, so you need to use green and far red. You know, you need to think about that, that setup as you do your experiment uh, so that you can get a sample that you can image uh, to, to best effect uh, using the microscope that you have access to. OK, so next we've got the microscope itself. Um, so. The first thing I would say is, uh, you know, these days, most institutions and universities have uh, a facility or imaging core. And in that facility, there'll be a specialist whose job it is to uh, train people and make sure that they know how to use the microscope. So the number one thing is to really, you know, engage in that training. And if you run into problems, talk to the specialist. If there's anything you don't understand about imaging, you know, tap them for information. They know so much stuff that uh, it's they're, they're really great to learn from. Um, you know, this is a really core cool tool. Microscopy is probably one of the major things you're going to do as a cell biologist. And so it's really worth becoming the best microscopist you can be. And so, you know, training is a really big part of that. OK, so which microscope are you going to use? Now, I'm assuming here you have a choice. Um, if you have a facility that's got lots of different types of microscopes, you might, you might be wondering which is the best one for your experiment. Um, so if you're lucky enough to be in that position, um, you can think about what each system will give you. So this is a, a diagram shown on the right here where uh, the different types of microscopy, so wide field uh, is shown as blue. You can see here it's really good on speed. 
Um, whereas something like confocal laser scanning microscopy, which is shown in red, is not as fast because of the way it has to scan the image. So wide field is fast, confocal is slower. Uh, however, the confocal is better on resolution than the wide field. So it depends on what sort of experiment you want to do. If you need speed, then uh, you need a, a fast imaging modality. If you need the resolution, perhaps you need to sacrifice that speed. The next thing is, again, thinking about your sample. Is the microscope you have access to, is it set up correctly for your experiment? Do you have the right filter cubes in there to image your sample? Uh, does it have the correct objective? There's, it's no use having access to a really good microscope, um, but it doesn't quite have the objective you need because you're interested in perhaps very small objects. And so you need high magnification, but the scope only has a, a lower magnification. So you need to think about that as well. There's trade-offs when you do imaging, and you can think about this as the photon uh, budget. So what we're doing in fluorescence microscopy is uh, throwing phot photons onto the sample and then collecting the emission from the fluorophores that we've used to label our sample. And uh, what this means is that uh, as we throw photons on, we, we are bleaching and doing damage to the sample. Um, now, if you need a lot of spatial resolution, that means you're going to have to put more light onto the sample, and that means more phototoxicity. If you want to uh, image for a long time, many frames, uh, perhaps many Z stacks, that's a lot of imaging, a lot of light going onto the sample, and again, the sample will suffer. So everything is a trade-off, and you need to uh, accept that at some point you can't have it all. It's not possible to do a three hour movie with sub-second resolution, uh, a really high spatial resolution, because the amount of light that's required will just kill your sample completely. So you, you, know, you need to think about if you need to image fast, maybe that's one experiment. And if you need a longer time frame, that should probably be a different experiment. So don't be afraid to split up your experiments in order to get the best data out of your sample. Then we need to take the images. So these days, it's no longer on, on film. Um, it's uh, all digital capture these days. Um, so just so we're on the same page, you know, what actually is an image that we capture? So a, an image, and there's one shown here, which is some kinetochores that have been labeled uh, in a human uh, cell line. And you can see that basically an image is a matrix of numbers. So uh, the, the X positions are shown here and the Y positions are shown here. If we blow up one of these kinetochores, you can see that it's just an array of pixels and each of these pixels has got a value. And so the higher the value, the, the lighter the, um, the white uh, intensity that's shown. Now the depth of that image refers to the bit depth uh, that it was captured at. So, uh, common bit depths you'll see are 8 bits, 12 bit, and 16 bit. And basically, the higher the bit depth, the more levels of gray that you have in your image. So the more defined features can be if they're higher bit depth than if they are at a lower bit depth. Now, computers tend to deal with 8 bit images. Um, they can deal with 16 bits, but uh, for display, it's usually an 8 bit situation. And you can downsample from 16 bit to 8 bit. Um, but if you start with an 8-bit image, it is possible to convert it to 16-bit, but you don't gain any extra information. Um, when you're capturing your images, the important thing is that you're in the dynamic range of the uh, detector of the camera. So what we don't want is to have any saturation of the image, uh, and we also don't want the samples to be too dim. We need to be right in this range so that we're using the full bit depth of the image if possible. Um, just an example shown here, sorry, it's a bit small, but uh, on, in the top left here, we have um, a picture of some mitochondria in, some, in a cell. And on the right is the same image shown with a lookup table, which shows us where the saturated pixels are. Now there's just a few red pixels here in this bright part of the image. So this, this image has been captured uh, well within the dynamic range of the instrument. If we crank the laser, or perhaps if we increase the exposure time, something like this, we can start to overload the image. And when we apply the lookup table, you can see that there's lots of red pixels now all across this cell. And what this means is that we've started to saturate the image and we are now losing information. 
So you can see in this part here where there's saturation, um, we, we lose this detail, which you can see in the image above. So we can see individual mitochondria in the image above, and then they're kind of lost and all start to merge together when the image is saturated. So you need to check that when you're um, taking your images. So related to this is that the settings should always be the same for all, all of your samples that you're imaging in order to quantify them properly. Um, so this is, is kind of obvious, but the only thing in your experiment that should be changed is the one experimental variable that you're measuring. So uh, if you're expressing a bunch of different mutants in cells and you want to look at the effect of those mutations, then you don't want any other change apart from those mutations in the proteins that you're interested in. So the settings of the microscope have to be the same for all of your samples. So there's two things about this. First thing is when you start your imaging session, you need to set those settings up. It's no good just imaging your negative control and then starting to image your test samples because you could run into a really bright sample and then everything's saturated and you need to start over again. So what you should do is start off by imaging your positive and negative controls or something where you know the min and max of your um, experiment. So you can set those settings up and then use them for the entire session. The second thing about this is that you should always image all the samples uh, in one imaging session. So it's no good imaging all your controls on a Thursday and then next Tuesday imaging your test sample because the laser power might change or someone might mess around with the microscope in the meantime. You need to image uh, all your conditions if you can in the same imaging session. If you've got too many conditions, what you need to do is break it down and either image, take fewer images of all of them or just image your controls and half of the conditions and then in your next session, image the controls again and the other um, conditions for your experiment so that you've always got something to compare it to. It's really important to capture the raw data. Uh, it's, it's very rare these days that a, a microscope capture software will compress the data, but you need to watch out that you're not losing any information through compression of the image. So always use um, the, uh, the, the sort of full raw uh, microscope format or TIFF, uh, if that's a, a lossless uh, image format that you can use. And the, the aim here really is to figure out as soon as possible whether you've taken all the public, publication quality images you need for all your conditions. So that means as soon as you've taken your images, uh, go ahead and get them analysed and try and assemble that figure as soon as possible. Because what you don't want to do is to just take a load of images and then in six months start writing your paper and realise that actually you don't have all the images you need. By that time, your samples have gone off or the cells that you are culturing are, are no longer available. Somebody's used all the antibody. Uh, it's really hard to, to get those samples set back up again. Whereas if you realize straight away, you can uh, jump back on the microscope and take some more images if you need to. So I would really advise you to, um, you know, really check what you've got as soon as, as soon as possible and try and get it analyzed and assembled quickly and make sure you know that you've got the ball over the line with this experiment. Okay, so we've taken the images. Now we need to make panel A, which if you remember was our sort of example data. Now, of course, we need to have done the analysis really to know whether our example data uh, represents uh, the uh, quantification that we've done, but I'll just talk about assembling panel A right now, uh, given that it relates to the images themselves. So you can see here on the left, we've got a panel A, um, and panel B, if you remember, was the quantification. And this is just an example here. So the way that we do this, and this is a kind of best practice uh, point, is that we show the individual grayscale channels uh, for the three things that we've imaged here. So uh, there's three uh, channels, and each is shown in grayscale. And then on the right, we have a merge, where they're merged in red, green, and blue, uh, corresponding to the fluorophores that we used in the experiment. Actually, this one is far red, but we, we will pseudo color it blue in the merge. Um, the other thing to notice about this figure is that we have um, the spacing here uh, is smaller than the spacing here. That's because these are different experimental conditions uh, in the different rows, whereas the columns all relate to one another. So it's a simple aesthetic thing to show, to, to demonstrate 
which images relate to which condition. We also show a scale bar down in the bottom right, and we can have an, a zoom of a uh, region of interest, an ROI, which in this case is a small square, which we can just blow up here and put that in a place of the image where there's nothing much going on. So we're not obscuring any details. OK, so this would be a typical panel A in a, um, a figure that, that we might make. So how do we do this? Um, so I would strongly advise against doing this manually, putting this together manually. Uh, there's uh, a lot of images there and the chance of making a mistake is quite high uh, if you do it manually. So what I would advise is use some software to do this. So I'll just show you an example in Fiji of the way that we do it in, in our lab. There's, there's multiple solutions to this, um, but you're welcome to use the one that we use in my lab, which is uh, available via an update site in Fiji. So if you open up Fiji, uh, click on help and update, uh, you get the image JUP data and you can add uh, update sites by clicking uh, manage update sites down here. And this opens this window. And what you can do is check the box for quantized, which is um, where we have our scripts for our lab. And uh, if you close this window and then um, click apply changes, It'll install those scripts and then you just restart Fiji and you can uh, access the code. So once you've done that in the uh, uh, menu bar, there'll be uh, an option called lab code. And in there, there's something called figure maker. And in figure maker, you can make montages. So these are the rows that I showed you in the uh, panel A earlier. You can then compile those into a, a, the full panel using montage compiler. And this is quite handy. You can even use make montage directory to have a, a, a um, folder full of images and then just assemble them all in exactly the same way and then go ahead and compile those into a really big uh, figure. And we, we make some really you know, large, complicated figures, which would be an absolute nightmare to do manually. Um, so it sorts out all the spacing and everything. So I'll just show you this in action. This is not really a tutorial. I'm just showing you how, how easy this is to to do. Uh, so it, this is speeded up, but uh, it comes from a demo that I did where I was kind of talking people through it. So I was, I was going quite slowly, uh, but it is a sped up movie. And what you see is we need to start with a square version. So the, the, the panels are all square. And then you just select which gray scale uh, channels you want and where the merge is going to be and what colors are in the merge. And then it will make those um, uh, montages for you, and then you can compile them into the uh, panel A. So that's a very simple way to, to do it. And it's um, it, it also uh, gives you a readout of, of which panels were assembled and all this kind of stuff. So you can remake the figures if, if required. As I say, there's other types of uh, montage compiler available, but I strongly recommend you, you do something automated here rather than trying to do it yourself manually. And so, so this gives us um, this type of thing here. Using the code as well, we can also do those ROI zooms I talked about and, and add the scale bar, although that wasn't shown in the, uh, in the uh, video. Just a quick note about the uh, merge. So we use a red, green, blue merge. And we do that because, well, firstly, we have three channels. And where red, green, and blue are the primary colors. So where they overlap, we have three different colors, yellow, cyan, and magenta. And where all three overlap together, we, we get white. So each of those colors has got a meaning in the merge. Um, and this is the sort of preferred way uh, for working. Now, the, the drawback with this is for colorblind people, they have difficulty seeing all of the colors. Um, but the, the nice thing about assembling your panel this way is that the grayscale channels are shown. So if you um, have color blindness and you have difficulty making out what's going on in the merge, you can compare these single grayscale images to understand whether there was any co-localization between the different channels. So it's, it's a way of doing the accessibility and dealing with the fact that there's three channels in these, in these images. If you have two channels, you can assemble a colorblind friendly merge, um, which is uh, preferable, but um, if you have three colors, that's uh, kind of difficult. So this is our preferred solution. Um, so hopefully I've said it enough times, but we use 
grayscale channels for the single channel. So I'm uh, just going to describe why we do that. And so sometimes in papers you see, um, they tend not to be cell biology papers, I must say, but anyway, um, pseudo coloring of single channels is a really, really bad idea. Um, so I, what I'm showing here on the right is a, um, a grayscale channel of a cell with some vesicles labeled up. And on the uh, left three panels is the, exactly the same image, but has been colored uh, red, green, and blue. Now you can see in green, we can see all the features, um, or at least I can, I don't know about you at home, but um, uh, we can see all the features in the green uh, as we can in the gray version. Now in red, uh, there are a few things start to become less visible. So the, the dim spots uh, are harder to see. That's because our eyes don't see black through red in the same way that we see black through green or indeed black through white. Um, it's even worse if we go to blue. So you can see in this blue uh, version here, although it's exactly the same data, we can only see the very brightest spots. So obviously if we want to compare what's the co-localization between these channels, um, just by looking at them, it's very hard to do when, when we've pseudo colored these single channels. So this is why we show um, things in grayscale, because you can then directly compare um, the, the channels next to each other. OK, the final thing to say is about contrast stretching. So um, you, you might take the image off the microscope and uh, it might appear a little dim. And you might want to crank the contrast a little bit to, to show it nicely in the, in the figure. And that's OK, uh, but you need to apply the same settings for all of the images that you show in that panel. So this is a, a figure from a, a paper about best practice of um, image, uh, image analysis. And in the top, you can see this is the original image. So we've got two nuclei here. Um, they look OK, but they're a little bit dim. So in B, what's happened is the contrast has been stretched. So the maximum pixel value has been uh, reset to show as, as white rather than being a slightly off-white color. So this is known as contrast stretching. Um, so that's fine, but you need to do the set, apply the same settings for all the panels. What's not OK is to um, stretch them differently. So on the left side of C, you can see that the um, stretch is the same as in B. But in uh, the right side of C, the contrast has been stretched differently. And that gives a misleading representation that these two nuclei were actually as bright as each other when that's not the case. So, um, so it's OK, but you need to apply the same settings for all. Uh, what I was talking about there was linear contrast stretching. There are um, nonlinear um, changes that you can do to images, such as gamma correction. I would advise people to not do this unless you really, really know what you're doing. And if you do do something nonlinear, you really should disclose it in the figure legend. Um, but I would stick to linear um, contrast stretching unless you uh, uh, know what you're doing, essentially. OK. Right, so we made panel A, great. Now we need to move on to panel B, which is the quantification of the data uh, of which an example is shown in panel A. So we need to analyze these images. So hopefully at the beginning, I kind of convinced you that quantification is key to understanding cell biology. And you, you probably know this just by reading recent cell biology papers that uh, most cell biology papers these days have quantification of data because it's no longer acceptable to just show some, some qualitative data and just take the author's word for it that their result is uh, what they say it was. Uh, it's better if we can just take some measurement and understand um, exactly what the spread of the data is like. So um, what we need to do is to automate our analyses wherever we can. This is uh, a sad fact, but when we humans try and do some image analysis, we tend to introduce errors and bias into the analysis. So we need to eliminate our interference with the image analysis process. So automation is totally the way to go. Sometimes you can't avoid some human intervention, and I'll describe ways around that in a moment. So we're aiming for reproducible research. And what I mean by this is that 
you know, if, if I have access to your raw data and your scripts to analyze that, I should be able to redo your analysis and get the same result as you. Um, so this will help other people who want to reproduce your work, but also help you in the future. Uh, even if nobody else wants to rerun your analysis, uh, you might need to in the future. Perhaps you collect some more data or you want to rerun the analysis, just changing a parameter. Having this uh, scripted and reproducible and automated really helps you to do that. Um, so there's two things about an automated analysis that, um, uh, well, the first one is obvious that the raw data needs to be read only. So we shouldn't overwrite our raw data and uh, get rid of it. So that's kind of obvious. But the second point yeah, might seem a little bit strange. So the outputs of the analysis should be disposable. Uh, now, this might sound strange because I'm telling you how to build panel B, but I'm telling you uh, that actually panel B is completely disposable. But the point is you should be able to make panel B whenever you feel like it, just by pressing a button using your automated procedure. That's what reproducible research is all about. Um, so the idea is, again, you know, if you want to rerun the analysis, you can just do it at the touch of a button and it just takes a few seconds or a few minutes. If you're relying on manual analysis and it takes you a day to analyze a, a, a data set, uh, and then maybe you go and show your PI and they say, well, have you thought about changing that parameter? That's another day that you've got to go and do your analysis all over again. If you've uh, scripted this up and it's all reproducible, you simply change a parameter, press go, and you can show your PI the, uh, the plots right there and then. So there's, there's a real advantage to doing this. And once you start doing writing your own code and, and building your own workflows and pipelines, uh, it really speeds up because you can just alter existing uh, scripts that you've got uh, and it gets a lot faster to write your code. So how does this work then? Um, so in my lab, typically this is what we do. This is a typical workflow. We would uh, pull down a copy of the raw data. Uh, so we start with that as the input. And then we do image analysis, usually using Fiji. And we would generate some output from that, which is usually a text-based thing. And then we would read that into R, do some number crunching and plotting and generate some plots. So that would be a typical workflow. We do have some, what are, so, so it's called a workflow because there are intermediates and we use two programs in that workflow. We do have some pipelines that are one program, you feed in images and out pops the result. So that's a pipeline. And we also have some workflows where there are lots of steps in between. Um, but this, I would say, is the typical where we, we do some image analysis in Fiji, which is totally open source and freely available. And then we can do the number crunching and plotting in R. So what does this look like? Um, in our lab, we have a Nikon microscope. So our raw data is in .nd2 format. So the raw data comes in in ND2 format. We can read it into ImageJ using bioformats, so that's not a problem. We tend to script uh, using ImageJ macro language, but you can script using a number of languages in, in Fiji. It's very flexible. The outputs would be um, uh, comma-separated value file, files, so CSV files, and probably you know, one for each image that we analyze. And then they can be read into R using a, an R script. So, um, you know, typically for a workflow, we would have uh, one uh, Fiji script and one R script, and we can save that together with all the analysis that we do. And that then becomes our reproducible package for um, doing that analysis whenever we uh, want to do it. So how does that look um, in terms of um, analyzing the data? So we... Um, Hang on, if I go here. So <clears throat> we've got this script here and a script here. So what do they do? This script would um, open each image <clears throat> and do some segmentation. So just to go back to this example, what we wanted to do here is we needed to analyze the number of spots per cell. Um, so this is the number of green spots. So that's a spot there and we needed to count them. And then on the right, what we wanted to do is work out the number of free spots. 
so that's the number of green spots that are associated with a red signal. So the red signal represented the mitochondria. So there was two types of analysis that needed doing, and this is what the workflow generated. Okay, so what we, what we did is we opened each image. We needed to segment the mitochondria. So segmentation is a process in image analysis where you um, differentiate between what is a mitochondria and what isn't. So you have a, a binary image um, of something that is the object of interest and something that isn't. So we needed to segment the mitochondria, we needed to segment the spots, and then count the spots that were within that cell, and then work out whether they overlapped or not, and then save that output uh, as a CSV file. So that was what our ImageJ script um, did in this particular case. Then with those CSV files, we read them into R using this R script. So we would read in all the CSV files, assemble them into a large data frame. And this would also involve labeling what condition uh, they corresponded to and which, which cell was which and so on. And we'd generate some calculations, which was to work out that percentage that I talked about, and then we would generate the plot. So that is how a, a typical workflow um, would, would work in our lab. And you can see straight away that once you have this set up, it's quite easy to change it because, you know, open each image, save output. You just need to change these steps in between and you can analyze a, a different type of experiment quite easily. And the same here, you know, once you can read in CSV files from image J and assemble a data frame, it's quite easy to do the uh, calculations and the plotting. So you can modify those existing scripts and not start again from scratch each time. OK, so when you're analyzing images, you really need to think about the question um, and how best to approach the analysis. This might sound a little bit odd because you've done the experiment and surely you, you know what, what sort of answer you're kind of searching for. But actually getting that information out of the images can be a little bit tricky. And maybe you need to experiment a little bit, be creative and think of ways to of different ways to quantify the images. A, a good rule of thumb is if you can't see something by eye, it's not going to be revealed by the computer. So no amount of wishful thinking uh, is going to change that. Um, equally, you know, it's it's good to sense check your, your workflows that, you know, if you see something by eye and then you get a different result by the computer, chances are you might have a bug in your code and you need to check that out. Accurate segmentation is the key to most image analysis pipelines. You, you just saw in the last example that we need to segment the mitochondria, we need to segment the spots. Those are two different segmentation problems. It's usually the most difficult step in any um, image analysis workflow. And you need to experiment a little bit to make sure you get that step right. In uh, ImageJ, uh, there are a number of algorithms that you can use to segment just on the basis of the values, the pixel values in the image. Um, often they work well and they're, they're the first thing you should try. But these days, there are some very good uh, kind of machine learning based methods like LabKit or whatever that can learn to segment things that, that you want to segment. And they're very powerful. Um, so you need to experiment a little bit, uh, especially if those inbuilt methods are not uh, giving you the segmentation results you were hoping for. The next point is, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. Chances are somebody else has tried to uh, tackle a very similar image analysis problem than the one that you're facing. Uh, a lot of code is out there and available, and you should just, uh, you know, try somebody else's code, see if you can modify it, and use that as a springboard for your own image analysis. Don't think you have to, um, you know, start from scratch every time, and certainly don't don't try and program anything really complicated unless you know what you're doing. Um, you know, the, the most of the sort of um, common tasks in image analysis are available in Fiji. And if they're not, they're probably available in some other uh, image analysis program. Um, so you need to be a bit, little bit flexible. Um, don't just think, well, it, it's not available in Fiji, so I'm going to just code it in Fiji. And, uh, you know, because that can uh, take a very long time to do. So just be, be flexible to jump around uh, with different softwares. You know, you just need the output and then get it back into the workflow that you're more comfortable with. 
So don't reinvent the wheel. Um, something that I just touched on earlier is you, you need to test each step. Uh, when you're writing code, uh, often actually when you're starting out, it's just a, a real victory to get code that runs all the way without, without any errors and actually gives you something at the end. And that's that's great. You should really celebrate that. However, you need to test that it's really doing what you think it's doing. It's fine it getting to the end and giving you a, a plot. But if that plot is nonsense, then you need to know about it. So there's ways to do this. You can you can use synthetic data. You know, you can randomize the pixels in your image, see if that gives you the same result. You know, it, that probably should break it. And if it doesn't break it, you should worry. Or you can even do simple things just looking back at your own data. Is the lowest point in your data set when you look back at the image, is that the, the dimmest or the one with the fewest spots or whatever? So you can do some sense checking and just make sure that your code is running and doing exactly what you think it's doing. But as I say, once you've got this workflow running, um, save those scripts with your with that experiment, and then that's that's there and it's reproducible, and you're good to to go with that again if you need to, or to modify it again in the future for a, a different figure. Um, so I promised I would come back to the manual um, point. Sometimes you you have to have a manual step. It's easier just to draw around the cell and um, you know do that manually or something. But what you must try and do is try to minimize the bias wherever you can. So one thing that's available in the update site that I mentioned is a tool called Blind Analysis, which basically takes away all the um, file names and also the labels, which are visible in Fiji, which might identify which experimental group it's from. So the idea here is that you can run Blind Analysis um, and then do your manual steps on these blinded images where you don't know which group they've come from. And then there's a text file saved to allow you to match up the analysis with the blinded image at the end. Um, and the reason to do this is just to reduce bias. Um, you know, if, if you uh, even if you think you, you uh, do this, uh, you know, without any bias at all, it, there's no harm in just running this blind analysis thing to prevent you from, um, you know, perhaps drawing uh, too generous a shape in the controls and these kinds of things that, that can happen uh, quite innocently, um, but it's a way of reducing bias. Okay, so we've um, got our workflow and we've generated some um, values and now we need to make those plots for panel B. So um, there's, a, there's a lot of visualization um, techniques out there, and I'm not going to cover them all, but I just want to cover the main ones that you might see in cell biology. So um, typically, we've got a distribution of measurements. So these first four um, plot types here, scatter dot plot, histogram, box plot, violin plot, are good ways to display the data. Uh, which one you choose depends on how many conditions you've got and how big the end number is. Um, other things you might see are a scatter plot where you've got two variables and you want to see how they relate to one another. Uh, or you might see a heat map, which is uh, to do with distances between variables. Or finally, you might have a line plot, which is how a variable changes over time, something like a uh, fluorescence over time, maybe it's a frap curve, something like this. Okay, so these are the common types of plots that you might need to make. So just a word on best practice. Um, these days, it's not okay to show um, bar plots with, with an error bar. So you, you, you still see these in, in uh, some papers, uh, but uh, journals these days are actually moving to ban these uh, altogether. So just so you're aware of that, um, this is a, a, a graphic which was made by Paige Puccini. What it shows is two groups here. They have the same mean and the same uh, error bar. So they look completely the same. But if we look at the box plot version, we can start to see that the two groups are slightly different. And then if we plot the histogram, we can see that the purple group is completely different from the green group. And that wouldn't be revealed if we just showed a bar and error uh, plot it's only revealed by plotting the distribution of data. So the current best practice is to, to plot out the distribution of data, and whether you use a scatter dot plot, histogram, box plot, or violin plot, they're all ways of showing what the all the data look like. So one thing that I, 
I quite like is these super plots. Uh, there's a, an article about them in JCB from Sam Lord. Um, and he, this is a, a figure from the paper where he's just describing the, the bar and errors. Um, and then a scattered plot. But what the super plot shows is which points came from which experimental repeat. And this, this is a really key uh, point that is sometimes missed that what, what we want to know is how reproducible was this result? Did, it, did um, the drug treatment always cause a decrease or was it just a uh, decrease uh, on a certain day or, um, you know, or was there variability that's random? Um, so I encourage you to have a, have a look at that, but um, just to say that the panel B that I've been showing you is a super plot where the individual points are cells from three different experiments and they're color coded according to which experiment um, it is. And you get a feel for how reproducible the, the data are um, just from looking at the super plot. So it's quite a nice way to display the data. In terms of making the plot, um, uh, as I said, we uh, use R and there's um, a library called ggplot, which is absolutely fantastic for making uh, graphics. Uh, and it's well worth learning R because it's it's important in the kind of data science world outside cell biology as well. So it's a, a good um, skill to have to be able to program uh, using R. Uh, there's also commercial uh, software available. We use Igor Pro a lot in my lab. Um, the point about all of these is that they're scriptable so that you can have a script that will generate the analysis and the plotting for you. Um, to, to make your analysis reproducible. Other packages that you might have used in the past, like Excel and things like this, they're not um, scriptable and they're not very reproducible in, in terms of generating graphics. And so I would, I would advise trying to stay away from them and use uh, professional plotting packages if you can. There are a number of web tools available um, online. Um, so if you're not so comfortable in programming with R, a great way to get started is use uh, Joachim uh, Godert's um, web apps. So he's got one that does super plots and one does um, uh, line plots and so on. And they're, they're just an R um, plot under the hood, if you like, but you interact with it via the web. And so they're a great way to get started. But if you're using it quite a lot, I would advise you to um, you know, learn, learn uh, some basic R um, coding to, to make some graphs. Whatever you output, it should be uh, in vector style, not a raster or bitmap. So PDF or EPS are great for exporting. Something that a, a flat image like a ping or a TIFF is, is, isn't as good uh, because if you've got it as vector, then it's easier to rescale it uh, when you move it into uh, Illustrator or, or um, Inkscape. So putting it together, we've made panel A and panel B, and we need to assemble this final figure. So we do this using either Illustrator, which is commercial software, it's very good, but it's very expensive, or Inkscape, which is a free open source alternative. So I had a lot of fun making a bad figure on the uh, left. And um, hopefully you can see why it's bad, um, but I will point out why it's bad uh, for you in just a second. On the right, we've got a revised version where it's exactly the same data, but I've tidied it up a bit. So in the bad figure, we have lots of white space. So this is really unattractive, uh, makes the figure look untidy. We also have different labels here. So A, B and C are different sizes and different fonts. Again, that looks really messy. The um, image here, this immunofluorescence image, uh, the cell is way too small, too much black space around it. You know, we need to get that cropped correctly to show off what we're, what we're actually looking at in panel A. We've got that pseudo coloring that I already talked about. So it's really hard to see what's going on in this blue channel and nothing's aligned and the grout is all wrong and it looks horrible. So on the on the right, I've uh, re remade that as uh, single grayscale channels with a merge, um, which I talked about earlier. In B, there's this um, horrible 3D graphic. Um, so there's no reason for it to be 3D. We just have um, five groups and five values. So that can easily be a bar chart in 2D. It doesn't need to be 3D. It's really hard to read this sort of graphic. And in C, 
we've got this um, sort of horrible default Excel graph with a lot of extra chart junk on there. So we've got a board around here with this cheesy shadow on the key, and there's lots of lines and things here, and there's no um, labels on the axes, all this uh, unnecessary color and so on. So we can replot that in C on, in the revised version, make it more rectangular, get rid of that white space, get the lettering the same, get everything aligned, and all of a sudden, you know, uh, the same data can be just made to really shine by just re a little bit of reorganization and taking a bit more care. Okay, so my second to last slide now um, about putting it together. The, the aim here, the absolute pinnacle of making a great figure is to make a figure that can be understood without reading the legend. Um, that's really hard to do um, because sometimes the amount of labeling you would need to not have a legend there is, is not practical, but you need to make the figure be as understandable as possible. Um, this helps when you're making a poster for a conference, but also for figures in a paper, um, just so that the reader can quickly skim it and understand what it is that your data are trying to say. Consistency and tidiness are the key to great figures. Um, just as I showed you, little things like aligning, keeping uh, things consistent go a long way. But you really need to check the relative sizing. Once you make that panel A and you make that panel B, and you put them together, you can sometimes find that the, the, um, you know, the text is too small in one or it's really big compared to the other one. So you need to look at it all together, figure out, does it look okay? Uh, resize it if needed. And feedback is really, really important. So what we've done in my lab in the past is have a figure club, which is like a journal club, but we take figures from papers and look at them and think, you know, how could it be improved? Or what was really nice about that figure that we could use in our own work? The other thing we've done in the, in the past, and we did this during lockdown actually, was share figures that we were making uh, in our Slack workspace for the lab and ask for feedback. So, you know, if we want to make a figure that's understandable without a legend, we should be able to show it to colleagues in the lab uh, who are not so familiar with it and ask them, you know, do you understand this? And it's amazing how much stuff, um, you know, a, a naive person can spot in, in a figure that you've been working on for quite some time. Often when you're working and you, you're too close to the subject and you don't see things anymore, they make sense to you, but they don't make sense to someone else. So really getting feedback on every figure is really important. Um, so yeah, share them amongst colleagues in the lab and, and see, see, what they, um, see what they think. Okay, so um, just that, that was it. Um, basically, I'm gonna end with a, a shameless plug for my book uh, because why not? Uh, if, you, if you liked what I talked about today, a lot of that is covered in the book, but also in the book I cover um, uh, more about programming, uh, more about statistics, what is N, how many times you need to do repeats, and also how to organize your sort of digital um, footprint of an experiment. Uh, so all of that is featured in the digital cell as well as um, the topics I covered today. Um, my, my lab don't just uh, sit around uh, just doing image analysis, we, we do interesting cell biology. Um, so if you're interested in some of the science we do, uh, which is membrane traffic and cell division based, uh, get in touch because I have pos positions open at the moment. Uh, I'd just like to thank the guys from the lab who donated images for this talk and for the digital cell as well. I'd like to thank Richard Sever from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press who had the idea for uh, the digital cell and he's been very supportive of, of me over the years. I'd like to thank the Public Information Committee for giving me the chance to do this webinar today. Um, and that's that's all I had to say. So I have a, an official slide to show you uh, in the meantime. Thank you so much, Steve. This was a terrific talk, extremely informative. In fact, we have a lot of questions to go through in this first part. So I'm really happy that we had this question coming through because it's something that you discuss very nicely in the book, but you didn't have the time to talk too much. So what is the recommendation for keeping raw data in relation to images that are obligatorily processed, for example, as in a risk and acquisition? This is a question concerning both data storage, the raw files are extremely large and difficult to keep with storage constraints, and data integrity. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, um, <clears throat> I mean, a lot depends on the infrastructure that you have available to you. <clears throat> 
at my institute, we have, uh, we're lucky, we have a large uh, file store and, and an Amero database, which handles all our uh, imaging. So, so the images come off the scope uh, and go overnight onto the um, onto the large storage uh, and is managed by an Amero database. So our raw data is, is held there and then we, we pull that down. When we do things like deconvolution of, of the images or some processing, um, yeah, we, we, so we, our practice is to pull down a copy, uh, work on that, and then we store that again in a high capacity file store, uh, but separate from our Amero database. So, so the Amero database is really holding the primary data, and then we have like lab storage to to store the other stuff. Um, but obviously, this depends on on the um, on what you have available at your institute. Another question is, what are your thoughts on using an invert lookup table on the grayscale images, essentially making the background white and the object black? Yes. Um, yeah, I, I like it a lot. Um, one of the uh, figures that I showed you today, we uh, I did that. Um, and I kind of didn't say that, actually. So thanks for bringing it up. If you've got an image that's there's a lot of black in there and there's some very small white spots, uh, particularly when the image gets uh, made smaller, which it might do in a journal, then those white spots can start to become a little bit invisible. And a really great way to visualize them is to flip the uh, the lookup table so that they appear black on a white background. Um, so yeah, the, actually the, um, the update site that I mentioned will do that as well. So it will convert those grayscale channels the other way around. Then another technical question is contrast, contrast stretching appropriate for automated data analysis as well if these rules are followed. So, um, so any sort of processing that you do to the image, you should you should always analyze the raw data. Um, now there's a there's an issue on when you load an image into Fiji, the way that it's displayed um, is different to the underlying data. Now, if you actually uh, change the pixel values, which is possible by, uh, if any Fiji users out there know this, it's the button apply in the brightness and contrast panel. Um, that will change the pixel values. And then when you do your analysis, you will get a different result than if you hadn't done that. So you should just analyze the raw data that comes off the microscope, but how it's displayed, you know, uh, here we're talking about, um, you know, how it's going to look on the printed page or how it looks on your monitor, then this is where contrast stretching uh, really helps you to visualize the data. So that's why I say it's OK uh, as long as it's done the same for all. But you shouldn't be changing the pixel values for, to do your analysis. And this is a very uh, great question because I think that it could help us expand a little bit uh, something that we discussed at the end regarding the color choice. So could you talk a bit more on color coordination of all the plots and schematics and how to choose a color palette and stick to it throughout the publication? Yeah, so um, I, I think what was so one advice I would have is if you see a nice color scheme that you like, just, um, you know, use it. Uh, I, I think each of us have different aesthetics of what we like. So I use a, a color scheme, which was, um, in, invented by uh, Paul Toll. Um, so we have a, a lab color scheme uh, which goes up to 12 colors for different experimental groups. And we also have a, a set color for the red, green, and blue labels on, on the uh, montages. And also for little things like we, we use drug treatments in, in our lab and they've got certain colors and we standardize those because we want every figure coming out of our lab to look the same. Uh, you, you may want a different aesthetic from, from your lab. So it's worth, um, you know, thinking about what colors you like and, and using them. But if you, I mean, there's lots of ways to generate palettes online. Um, you know, the, the choice is almost limitless. Um, I mean, some, some of the defaults I have to say in, uh, in uh, ggplot in R are quite nice and uh, go a long way. Um, you just need to, I mean, what, um, Sorry, I don't want to take too long on this, but um, one of the other tools in the update site is to uh, allow you to look at the image uh, to allow you to see what it would look like as a, for a colorblind person. And so what, one thing I would suggest is, you know, just think about what it looks like for, for everybody and also what it looks like when it's printed off in black and white. There's still people that print off papers. 
in black and white. And if you've used a fancy color scheme, but you can't actually tell the difference between the groups, this is something you need to think about ahead of time. So do you have also resources eventually where people could start looking at to find a kind of palette or color combinations that can be user friendly, can be kind of color blind friendly kind of to take as an example for their paper, for their graphs? Um, yeah, I mean, the, so the one that I mentioned, um, the one from Paul Toll, which was, um, uh, that is sort of colorblind safe. And there's there's another uh, really great resource um, by Kathy Brewer, which is called Color Brewer in R. And, um, you know, there's, a, there's an online um, kind of tool that allows you to look at how those colors look next to each other and how they, uh, you know, which ones are colorblind safe, which ones aren't. Um, so, you know, those are two tools that I would really recommend. So, um, you know, yeah, so Paul Toll and uh, the Color Brewer uh, Library in R are, are really great resources. So we receive a lot of questions about coding. So first is, uh, do you hire any anybody in your lab that is, is not able to code? And then uh, uh, related questions are if you can give advice or resources for people that has never have never coded and they would like to start a coding and trying to apply some of the advice that you gave during this presentation. Yeah, so it's it's a mix. I have to say, so my lab is a is a wet lab. You know, we're not a kind of dry software driven lab at all. And really, what my book was about, and I'm I'm honestly not trying to push you to buy my book, but um, the the why why that why I wrote that book was because I really feel that um, people who do wet cell biology work who traditionally don't do a lot of programming just by learning a few simple skills you can really take your cell biology to the next level um, you don't have to be a complete ninja coder whatever uh, you just need a, a, a few tools to learn how to script in in image j as I as I said, you know, it's just one script in ImageJ, one script in R, and you can you can do the whole thing. And there's so many resources available to learn. There's my book, but there's also a, a number of other things. At our university, we have somebody who do, who provides training for um, people learning to code. You know, perhaps learning a bit of Python and things like this. Um, and it's. But I have to say, you know, running a lab of cell biologists, it's a mix. I've got some people in the lab who, you know, really took to it and um, flourished and can program really, really well and, and are doing great. And then there's other people who it doesn't come naturally to them. And, and actually one way that I stay in touch with what's going on in the lab is I help out with doing programming uh, and analysis because um, it, it's sometimes quicker for me to do that. It's, it's much harder for me to go and take some images on the microscope with everything else I do as a PI, but I can do a bit of coding. Um, so that's the way that I do it in my lab. So we have a question about segmentation. So I find segmentation, like you said, to be the most difficult. It's really difficult when using the same settings for different samples, say for different mutations, which shows slightly different spatial behavior or clustering. Can we change segmentation parameters in such cases uh, within the same experiment? Yeah, so, I mean, yes, it, it depends. I think, um, I mean, the the, um, the tool that I mentioned, the machine learning one, LabKit, you need to normalize the data before it goes in. So, you know, if you've got a dim sample and a bright sample, and then you try to analyze them with the same thresholding settings, uh, you're going to get a different result. I mean, it really depends on what you're on what you're doing, and so it's very hard to give generic advice. I would say, but you can you can get quite far by um, uh, you know processing the image before you do the thresholding. So um, doing background correction, um, correcting for uneven illumination, things like this. Um, but there are ways to do it, and. Uh, yeah, you need to put in some effort to uh, to get thresholding to work nicely, um, and it it's very it can be very frustrating. I I know, but uh, it really depends on your question and how you need to threshold, how you need to segment. Should I say? Um, I mean, one other tip is if you can, you know, design your experiment in a way where you segment so, uh, something else that you're not measuring. Um, if you're if you're having to segment the thing that you're measuring, then obviously it changes, and then it's difficult uh, if you're if you're segmenting a third thing or you know a second thing that's unrelated then the, the whole problem gets a lot easier 
Um, so, you know, thinking about that when you design the experiment can, can help as well. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't be more specific because it really depends on the application. So we're running a little bit late, so I think that we can answer a couple of questions more. So one is, do, Im do images have to be presented as a rectangle? In other words, if you have a round cell, can you show a circular crop of your image to save space and, and, space and reduce black space? Well, I've never seen that happen. I, I wouldn't do that personally. I'm totally in the, the guys in my lab will tell you I'm totally into this square thing and that's how that workflow works. Um, yeah, I don't know what you would do with the other, I don't think it would save you that much space to be honest, because you know, the, yeah, I don't think it would save that much space because you'd have to show the other channels and then it would take up the same, same amount of space in the end, I think. Okay, this is another in very interesting question about co-localization because you also didn't cover that so much in your talk. Yeah. Any, and, uh, any thoughts on the use of co-localization coefficients such as Pearson correlation coefficient or least intensity correlation coefficient as opposed to more manual threshold based counting such as how many green particles are red? Yeah. Yeah, you know, this, this is a, I mean, it's an unsolved problem basically in cell biology. Um, uh, yeah, there are, there are two main methods for those that don't know. You can have a pixel-based uh, thing where you look at the intensity of all the pixels or pixels in a subregion, or you can have a kind of co-occupancy style thing where you threshold first and then look at the overlap. Um, I have to say, I, I tend to prefer the overlap, thresholding and overlap-based methods myself. Um, yeah, we've, I mean, we've written some routines to try and tackle that. You can see by the number of tools that are available and the number of papers on it that it's it's not there's no universal answer and it really depends on your application um and what you want to get out of the image um so and that's why i avoided it in this webinar because it's a it's a really uh, difficult topic so i would conclude with this last question so thanks for the talk, of course. What are your thoughts on using MATLAB for processing and analyzing images? Uh, you mainly cover image and R, but I've also seen people using MATLAB. What are some advantages and disadvantages to using either of these options? Is it sample specific? Um, so I, I personally don't have anything against MATLAB. Um, I, I actually really like coding in Eagle Pro, which is similar to MATLAB. It's a commercial software. Um, it's really powerful. You can load in images, you can do all the analysis, you can generate graphs. I mean, the problem with it is that, uh, you know, for someone to use your code, uh, they would need a license. I mean, with MATLAB, you can make an executable style thing so that people can use it, but it's, it's not open source. And what we're really shooting for these days in science is for uh, reproducibility and openness. And MATLAB and Igor Pro, sadly, are not really compatible with that. There are some fantastic tools already available in MATLAB. And so, um, you know, it's possible to use somebody else's tool and then take the outputs and do something open with them. Um, but, you know, I, to be honest, I'd be more, I, I would prefer people to script and code and do analysis in a reproducible way in MATLAB than not at all. So, you know, don't get the wrong idea. I'm not discouraging that, but um, I think trying to use open software as far, as much as possible is, is the way to go. Thank you so much, Steve. So many people here ask if you could share with, uh, with them uh, the link for the resources that you presented. So maybe we can find a way to, to share it with, uh, with the recording of the webinar, also especially of the movie recording of your lab package to do the automatic assembly, for instance, of the figures that will be extremely useful for the audience. And then uh, thank you very much for everybody who attended today. We are looking forward to see you during our next webinar that will be in November with Beata Mierza presenting and giving a different perspective on, communication, on communicating visually. So thank you so much for coming today.